Temple University. This is Profiles in Literature, featuring interviews with authors and illustrators prominent in American literature for children. The moderator for this series is Dr. Jacqueline N. Schachter, Professor of Children's Literature with Temple University. Welcome to Profiles in Literature. My name is Jacqueline Schachter, and I take pleasure in presenting today our guest from Chappaqua, New York, the Newbery Medal winner, Jean George. While we get a close-up view of your Newbery Medal and your International Hans Christian Andersen Award, won't you please tell us what books are responsible for these prizes? Julie of the Wolves won the Newbery Medal, and my side of the mountain won the Hans Christian Andersen honor list. And didn't uh, you also win the um, honor book award for my side of the mountain? Yes, that was also a Newbery honor book. Joining us in paying tribute to this multiple award winner is Mrs. Carolyn Field, coordinator of work with children of the Free Library of Philadelphia, my collaborator on the Profiles in Literature series, and my colleague, Dr. Robert Marhar, Temple University Professor of Children's Literature. Jean George is not only the writer, but often also the illustrator of her books. We're going to see some samples of her illustrations. From Dipper of Copper Creek, which received the first Orian Award of the American Library Association for the best juvenile book dealing with animals that developed a humane treatment. Another illustration from the Summer of the Falcon, and these pictures from Vulpus the Red Fox. What media did you use in these This books? is watercolor. I uh, dip the paper in the bathtub and get it soaking <laughs> wet, and then use those old Chinese inks and brushes on wet paper so that it runs and it does the drawing for me. Did you not bring also some original illustrations with you? Um, what books are they for? Yes, I did. I brought Mef the Pet Skunk and these are two skunks that were really my pets. And they lived in the house with me and they were not descended. <laughs> oh, no <laughs> kidding. They never <laughs> sprayed. <laughs> and this other one is from Volpe's the Red Fox. And again, this is a personal pet. And she posed for me in this picture. Wasn't Volpe's your first book? This was my first book. That's right. Done in what year? 1948 it came out. It's amazing. You know, a she's done 41 <laughs> books total of 41 books that you've written. It's, it's really amazing. Uh, what other artwork did you bring with you? Do you have a little folio? I have a notebook that I kept when I was in Alaska doing Julie of the Wolves. I sketch as I take notes because I can feel myself on scene more when I write if I have little drawings of the country. These are the wolves I watched, lying on my stomach in the cold willows, looking through a spotting scope. There was the alpha male, the alpha female. These are the leaders of the pack. Two hunters and nine puppies. And I watched them from about 6 o'clock in the evening when they awakened through the night, because of course it's Alaska and the sun doesn't set until about 2 o'clock, and again watch them come in at dawn, returning from the hunt. What inspired you, incidentally, to get involved with the a setting? Mm -hmm. a, a with the wolves? Mm -hmm. I read an article by uh, Ginsburg at the Brooklyn, uh, the Brookfield Zoo in Chicago on the social behavior of the wolves, and it so intrigued me, it was so like the human family, that I followed up the research at Barrow, Alaska, and met the scientists there who were working with the wolves and studying their behavior, and then went on to McKinley National Park to watch a wild wolf pack and pick out the alpha, and 
try to decipher their language. You know, they really communicate almost as well, better than most animals, the almost wolves, as well as people. Do. The wolves do. You know, this uh, notebook is full of notes, uh, including some written by Eskimos. That's of, right. Of mm -hmm. some of the uh, terms used for, I noticed, for the owl and so forth. Did you know a little girl like uh, Julie? I actually, Julie is a woman, an older woman I met who befriended me. We both had uh, something in common that her husband felt. We were both sort of leaders. She knew I came from the States with some credentials. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I saw a little girl walking across this lonely, vast tundra by herself. And she was the one that inspired me to uh, make Julie a little young girl going across. What year was it that you uh, met the old woman and saw the girl going across the country? This was in 1970. In 70. Mm -hmm. okay. I spent the summer at Barrow, Alaska and McKinley National Park. Uh, Could I ask, is uh, Barrow, Point Barrow, as smelly and dirty and ugly as I hear? It is. That, uh, we should be ashamed as Americans that we treat the Eskimos the way we do. And let them live in such field. It's a garbage huh? Yeah. Well, I'm glad that you have a protagonist, though, that's pre-adolescent or adolescent, because it's better in terms of children's literature for, for students to relate to. Actually, um, the wolves relate to children better, too. Oh, do they? And, of course, I prefer writing about children. It's much more interesting than writing about adults. They have so far to grow and go, go and evolve. That, yeah. Would you show us something of your sketching technique on a little larger scale? All right. Shall I draw the wolves? <laughs> oh, that would be great, yeah. wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. I'd like to see it. All right. I like to uh, sketch as I write. Do you think more in picture? Yes, I do. Now, let's see. I'm going to do a family of wolves, and these will be the ones I saw. This is the alpha female, and she guards over the other females and the puppies. So I better put some puppies in. Now there is an alpha puppy, the leader of the puppies. And he is distinguished by the fact that he is fearless. He initiates all the activities, and I'm having them playing bone ball here. <laughs> this is a wolf game that's very much like football. They grab a bone, fight over it, run down the field. One drops it, another hops on it, and picks it up and runs the other way while there are puppies cheering on the sidelines, very much like cheerleaders. So here, this one's going to be the alpha. He has his, he will carry his ears higher, his tail higher, his head higher. These are things, you know, we all notice in people and kings and same behavioral traits. And this is the mother watching over this game because she is the one, during this period of life, the alphas are established. And they often fight. And that in order that they not harm each other, she watches over them very carefully. And once the alpha is established, it never changes through life. So they do all their fighting when they're very young, and when the mother is watching them, they can't hurt each other, which is a very good system. Mm -hmm. And these are the mountains, the beautiful mountains of Alaska, which are being, I hope not, but probably torn apart by that pipeline. Mm -hmm. This is the way I play around with Oh, oh, magnificent. Great. I want to watch. Oh, I want to watch. Oh, that's <laughs> tremendous. That's uh -huh. tremendous. 
uh, you know, we've just barely probed into Jean George, the artist. Mm -hmm. Now let's get a view of Jean George, the writer, with an episode from her book, My Side of the Mountain. This book features Sam Gribley, a youth who ran away from a large family in New York City to prove he could live off the land on his own resources. Sam hides in the Catskill Mountains, armed with flint and steel to build a fire, a penknife, some string, an axe, and a few dollars. He generally avoids human beings who get lost on his side of the mountain and contents himself with animal friends. However, one day after hearing what seems to be a departing police siren, he finds a man sleeping near his treehouse. Sam believes the man is a bandit in hiding who won't tell on him, so he awakens the stranger. Hi. It's all right, they've gone. If you don't tell on me, I won't tell on you. Oh, thanks. Um, you're a sight for sore eyes. I don't know anything about you. And I don't want to. You don't know anything about me and don't want to. But you may stay here if you like. No one's going to find you here. Would you like some supper? Have you got some? Yes, venison or rabbit. Well, venison. You've really got venison? Desdemondia. May I call you Thoreau? That'll do nicely. I'll call you Bandit. That's close enough. <laughs> I'll be glad to help. I'll teach you how to live off the land. It's very easy. No one need find you or know what your business is. And just what do you think my business is? Well, you're not a minister. Right. You're not a doctor or a lawyer. Correct. You're not a businessman or a sailor. Not at all. Nor do you dig ditches. I do not. Well. Guess. You're a murderer or a thief or a racketeer and you're hiding out. What's funny, Bando? <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. Thoreau, my friend. I'm just a college English teacher lost in the Catskills. I came around to hike in the woods, got lost, found your fire and fell asleep beside it. I was hoping the scoutmaster and his troop would be back for supper and help me home. Oh, no. <laughs> you see, Bando, before I found you, I heard squad cars screaming up the road. Occasionally, you read about bandits that hide out in the forest, and I was sure you were someone they were looking for. <laughs> well, if you're not a bandit, you'll have to go home very soon. And there's no point in teaching you how to live on fish and bark and plants. Well, I can go in a little while. This is summer vacation. <laughs> I'll admit I hadn't planned to eat crayfish on my vacation, but I'm rather getting to like it. Maybe I can stay until your school opens. That's after Labor Day, isn't it? <laughs> you mean you're going to try to winter it out here? I think I can. <laughs> well, Thoreau, I've led a varied life. Dishwasher, sax player, teacher. To me, it's been an interesting life. Just now, it seems very dull. Say, what are we going to have for supper? I'm famished. Venison's boiling. Brown puffballs are cooking in deer fat with wild garlic. Those are tubers wrapped in leaves and stuck in the coals. I've got cut up apples boiling with dog tooth violet bulbs. 
and we've raspberries for dessert. Thoreau, you're a genius. Come on, let's see. Bando becomes a welcome guest to visit Sam at Christmas and in the spring. But it's Sam's endurance which is featured in the memorable My Side of the Mountain. What were you thinking as you saw that, Jean George? I was intrigued. It's beautiful. <laughs> Wasn't um, My Side of the Mountain made into a Paramount film? Yes, it was. And have any of your other books been adapted into film? We're working on Julia the Wolves right now. Oh. Is Rob Radnitz uh, doing No, that? he isn't. A young woman named jean Vieve Gillazou, a French woman who is the first woman producer in about 25 years, is doing Julia the Wolves. She's the only one in existence at this point. Very young, very beautiful, and very devoted to the book. Is it an independent company? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm going to look forward to it. Has it been cast it. yet in, in production? Or they just They're casting the wolves, which is taking a <laughs> long time. They have to raise them together. And Are you working on the script? Or I will be working on the script, yes. Well, that'd be exciting, yes, that a new will aspect be. of writing. Uh, Carolyn, it's your turn, you and then Bob, to ask a question before I resume. Well, I have a question that has quite a bit of background. It, it relates okay. to what we've seen, my side of the mountain. Mm -hmm. uh, Jane George, as a mother, how could you write a book like My Side of the Mountain? If we believe that books can influence children for good, and which, which I as a librarian firmly believe, when this book came out in 1959, I read it, enjoyed it, and was horrified that it would be made available to children because I could see all the boys and girls, even girls running away from home, living on the mountains, I was horrified at the parents' <laughs> attitude of not finding that uh, little boy, Sam, and so forth. Wh what was in your mind? This Precisely was, that. You, you wanted them to run away. <laughs> I thought of, uh, the editor and I talked it over, and it was not going to be published for that very reason. Mm. The publisher said, no, we can't have children running to the mountains. And we both said, better they run to the mountains than the city. And of course, this whole camping outdoor thing has evolved, and everybody goes backpacking now, and you pack your own food along. But the outward bound movement, uh, I didn't anticipate all this, but I had such a good time doing it as a child that I wished every other child could do it. But my objection is that this child is alone. I can see it with uh, an older person or a family, but for the child to be on, on his, his own, now, I'll admit I've changed my mind. We didn't buy the book at first. Didn't you? No, I didn't, even though it was a notable book, one copy. But we have bought it since, and of course the movie has also made the book very popular. Well, that's the dream world of the child. Right. Mm -hmm. To be alone and independent of your parents. And I read it to some youngsters just before it came out. I was asked to come over to a school, and one little boy, and terribly engrossed in it, just spontaneously said, that's what I am not. I'm not independent of my parents. And he loved it for that reason. Well, did you that's read English stories? Because th this is one of the things about most uh, books uh, written by English authors for children. The parents are not around. The children are usually on their own. And I wondered if that, this I'm had influenced I'm not sure that influenced me. What really influenced me were my parents' attitudes about this. And they would take us out along the Potomac River and put us on an island and say, make a living off your place, the place. My father taught me everything in that book. We ate everything I've described, all those delicious mm -hmm. tubers and crayfish. Um, so to me, it was a way of life. I had no um, sense that anyone would react this way to it. Well, Sam's substitute for human beings were the animals. You know, that, that comes out pretty clearly. Uh, Bob, you have a question about... I have a question, book. but you know, as I listened oh, to Carolyn, it triggered something in my mind. That's almost a recurring uh, pattern in many of her, her books, that the child faces these various mm -hmm. problems alone in this mm -hmm. uh, either rebellion or questioning of authority. And uh, it's almost as though you, you identify that as a very critical point, because in book after book, the... Uh, the setting is around a child who's coming to grips with this notion of independence and um, so forth. Uh, was this a critical period in your life? Um, yes, I think it was in my own life. I was, I was rebellious. I resented 
authority, and I was more or less uh, a loner be for a very interesting reason. My brothers, who are ecologists too, were identical twins, and they had this great thing going between them, and I was always me too, let me come along. Mm -hmm. So uh, I also feel that this is like the development of the human child they go through, the loving the mother, the father, the family group, and then that moment of independence where they've got to be alone with themselves before they can go on and join the human society. And I, I feel this happened in Sam, Julie, I, it happens to most of my children. Mm -hmm. While you're on this thematic kick, before we go to your specific book, tell us what you see are, as the major themes of your books. A child's relationship to the earth, I, if I can put one great big one, mm -hmm. and how he senses and grows correctly among the plants and animals and the idealized way to live as far as I'm concerned. And finding himself. Finding himself and becoming an independent person and personality. Let's uh, shift to you. Gene, your books reveal not only a love of animals, but a very thorough understanding of them. Um, you have uh, books that deal with uh, a number of animals, but I see birds coming through in many, many of the books. And I'd like to have you make a few comments of uh, your background and how you gain this knowledge and your fascination with these animals. It uh, is very obvious that this is a part of you. Well, my very first pet was a turkey vulture that my father brought in from the wilderness and gave to me a little white, fuzzy, beautiful bird. And finally we got rid of it because it would sit on the kitchen door and watch my mother cook and she couldn't abide that very long. All our pets as children were birds. There were falcons, there were robins that came in. And then I studied more deeply into the uh, ethology or bird behavior at the University of Michigan. But I always had, could identify easily with birds. I don't know quite why, but I probably the childhood experiences with them. Mm -hmm. Your father is uh, Dr. Craighead, who specializes in the study of insects, That's doesn't right. he? Mm -hmm. But he brought such a vast knowledge of bird life into your home. He was really the first ecologist in his way. He was uh, a student of entomology, but he saw that you couldn't just study the insect. You had to study the tree the habitat, the other animals in the environment, that the whole thing was tied up in one balanced uh, ecosystem. Which is represented in Who Really Killed Cock Robin. Did you have a chance to ask your question? Yeah. Uh, you yes, and uh, I'd like to center in on goal number 737. Mm -hmm. Did you actually live on Block Island? Yes. And um, <laughs> did you experience the episodes that uh, are revealed in this book? And yes, I did. Um, this was at a time when they were having problems with birds and airplanes and at a time when they were just breaking through into the language of birds and realized they had an alarm cry that w they could control them through their own language. This and in addition, Nico Tinbergen's extraordinary study of the herring gull called the herring gull's world. He finally won the Pulitzer for it this year, but it is the most comprehensive study into the behavior of any animal short of uh, von Frisch's bee studies. Mm -hmm. And I used a great deal of his material in this book, the clubs, the language, the calling. Well, I want to shift from that book, which deals with uh, the gull, to The Summer of the Falcon, which is a favorite of mine. Uh, isn't it largely autobiographical? Yes, it is. Did your mother really permit you to keep dead sparrows wrapped in wax paper in your icebox? Yes, she did. For the falcon? <laughs> I'm telling you, the mother, the the mother, mother was very... unusual as well as the papa. And what are your twin brothers doing now, occupationally? Because they had this very early start in ecology. They are working on the grizzly studies in Yellowstone National Park. They are the ones that put the radios around their necks and found out where they went, where they denned and are fighting for the grizzly right now. It's on the way out 
and vanishing. And uh, doing um, books themselves mm -hmm. and research. Will this be a source for a new book by you? Uh, bears are always my longing. Uh, but I feel it's their material. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Jean, we always think of you as an author, really. And I'm, I'm always amazed myself when I look at it and it says uh, it's illustrated by you, too. What is your background as an illustrator, an artist? Well, um, I wanted to write and illustrate ever since I was in third grade because I felt if I couldn't do one or the other very, very well, I could fall back on one or the other. <laughs> But I did study art at Penn State, where I went to college, and then went to Louisiana State University and began a master's degree in it, but decided that it was silly to get a master's degree. I really wanted to write and paint, so I came back and uh, went into the newspaper work, and I sketched for the newspapers. They would sell me in, send me into court or up on the hill where they couldn't take a camera. <laughs> well, you, it was interesting when you were drawing and you said you think you write and draw at the same time. Can you explain that a little more? You talk and, and draw at the same time, I know that. Uh, I do. As I'm writing my books, I keep a sketch pad and I draw all the town or the mountain and mark off where everybody is and keep little... Just like the director of a play. Right. Keep little sketches along the way. You've led a very unusual life as a woman. Uh, I, I wonder, uh, have you passed on the same adventurous spirit to your daughter? I hope so. She left high school and went to the Sorbonne, the state of France, and then went to London for a year and worked with hair production. Then she came home and went to Bennington College and went out with my her cousins on Eagle Studies. I give her uh, all the encouragement I can and right now she's getting her master's degree at uh, the Bank Street School. Mm -hmm. So she's into the children. Good. Is she interested Very in education? Good. Very interested uh -huh. in education. Uh, well, that's, that's interesting. And she'd like to teach by adventure. She says. And then you, you <laughs> also um, have this uh, great uh, love of outdoor sports. Tell us something about whitewater canoeing that you were a fan of. Well, that's, uh, it's such a beautiful thing to canoe whitewater because you're part of the stream and the river. And I love to get down inside of the tongues and troughs. And I suppose all the sports I do eventually lead me into the environment. I like to hike, backpack, cross-country uh, ski. And I believe it's because in writing, you've got to live in waterfalls and streams in order to write about them. You do that very well in Dipper of Copper Creek. Um, I want to thank you very, very much, Jean George. It's been a pleasure to present a former newspaper writer and present book and magazine writer and illustrator who's been way ahead of her times. For over 20 years, over 20 years, you have uh, urged protection of the environment, the right of females to develop their talents fully, and a genuine scientific interest and love of animals. So we very, very much appreciate your coming.